Good evening again everyone. You're very welcome to Shiloh. Welcome to those watching in on Facebook or on YouTube. I'm just going to pray for God's word before we get into it. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray tonight that your word would triumph, that it would do its work in each of our lives, that you would give us ears, Father, to hear what it is that your word is saying to us. But Lord, we don't want to just be hearers. We want to be doers of that word. And so we pray that the Spirit of God would enable, equip, and empower us to be doers of that word, please, in Jesus' name. Speak to us all, Lord. Speak to those watching in on Facebook or in YouTube. Lord, may each of us hear your voice tonight. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, as you know, we're, we're going through Mark's Gospel. We've called it Journeying Through Mark's because I couldn't think of any other title. And the last time we looked at the parable of the sower. And this was used by Jesus to emphasize four types of people. So when you're reading the parable of the sower, so you may get loads of other ideas of what this parable is all about. But basically it's about four types of people and their heart toward the word of God or toward the gospel. And so we heard the last time that there were the waysiders. And so the sower, the farmer had gone out with the seed and he was scattering the seed like this into his field and some of it fell on the wayside. And so we called them the waysiders. These are people who hear the gospel, but they have no interest in it whatsoever. And I wonder how many of us, you know, maybe over years were in Bangor Market and there was a wee man, Mr. Wilkinson, would have stood and said, gospel track, gospel track. And, you know, and people would have taken them or outside the Northern Bank, there would have been people preaching about Jesus or outside the Ulster Bank preaching about Jesus. And you felt wick having to walk past them because you knew you weren't, you weren't one I am. And, and, and when they talked about you're going to hell, you just knew they were talking to you. You know, I felt it for years even after I was a Christian. And they were saying, oh, you're going to hell. <laughs> you know, panicking as I was going past. But waysiders are people who hear the gospel. They hear the word of God. And see in this country here in Northern Ireland, most of the people in Northern Ireland are without excuse because if we don't hear it in the sense of someone preaching it in the church or preaching it on the street or if we don't hear it somehow on social media or whatever else, we see it, as I've mentioned many times, on trees. It's nailed to the trees, you know, on the, the most awkward bends on the road that says, prepare to meet thy God. You know, when I see it, I know I need to slow down. People hear the gospel, but they have no interest in it. That's the waysiders. And then there was the stoners. And the stoners are not people who smoke cannabis. The stoners are people who hear the gospel. But they're not really interested. They might express a bit of an interest just to sort of be nice to you when you're telling them about Jesus. They'll smile and nod their head and whatever else. But really, they've no interest and anything that may begin to look like it's working in their lives, it will come to nothing because they are shallow people. They are fickle people. They will smile and nod approvingly or whatever else, but they're saying, I wish the hell he would find somebody else to go and speak to. I wish he would hurry up and go. They have no interest whatsoever. And then you have the pricks. Then you have what are those who fall among the thorns. I call them the pricks. People who let all their things in life choke the very life of the word of God out of their lives. And so they may be interested. They may express a real interest in hearing the gospel. But the reality is they've got so many other things going on in their lives that those things become the thorns that choke the word of God out of their lives and it never is able to produce fruit. And then the last of the four types of hearts was the prepared. And these are people whose hearts are prepared to receive the word of God. And it's the spirit of God who is moving in the hearts of people who prepare their hearts to receive the word of God. These are the prepared people. And I asked last time, what condition is your heart in toward Jesus and the gospel? And even if you're a Christian here tonight, if you're a Christian watching it on Facebook or on YouTube, the same question applies. 
What condition is your heart in tonight? Because as a Christian walking with the Lord, you can allow the, the, the heart to become hard. You can allow the heart to become calloused. You can uh, require the heart to be dug up in that sense and to be prepared. And God may bring in certain circumstances in your life to dig up the soil of your heart to make it more receptive to the word of God. Don't think, Christian, that walking your Christian life, that all the time your heart is soil that is prepared always to receive the word of God. It's not. Very often you too can be sitting in a church and it's just way over your head. Too often you can hear a brilliant sermon, probably not in Shiloh, but you will hear a brilliant sermon and you'll go out the door of a church and the birds of the air will have stolen it like that. You can't remember what was spoken about. Too often you will think, I can't be bothered today. I can't, I don't want to hear that. That's not the message that I need to hear today. Or you too can allow, this is Christians, you too can allow things in your life to choke the word of God or choke the life of the word of God out of you. You've always got to be saying, Lord, give me a heart that's prepared to receive your word. Anyway, give you a laugh. As you know, one of the most beautiful uh, fruits of the Spirit is patience. Well, I have that. It just oozes out of me. (laughs) (laughs) And this week, this week, I needed to get a father-son lamp. Does anybody know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about a father-son lamp? It's real, right? A father-son lamp is ordinary lamp with an arm that comes out like that with a bulb in it, right? And that's what I have in my living room. I have a lamp that sits and then I've got the wee arm that comes out in the morning and it shines a light directly on my Bible so that I can read my Bible in the mornings. Uh, And it's really effective. But this week, I needed to get a new father-son lamp. It was vitally important to me to get this. And so John and I, off we went round the Argos. Uh, it was the only place I could see. There was this hideous one in home base. In case anybody's interested in getting themselves a, a you know, don't. home base had a hideous one. Had like an old person lampstand type thing with a big stupid thing on it. Uh, and I just wouldn't be having that in my house. But we saw one in Argos, almost exactly the same as mine. So flew around, we got it, paid the money for it. And then we brought it home. And no matter how much I tried, even following the instructions, which would be better called destructions, even following the instructions, I just could not get this thing put together. And the more that I tried, and the more that I forced it and forced it, it just wouldn't come together. And then the more I became angry with the thing until eventually I took the entire lamp out into the backyard and threw it out and trampled all over it and smashed it to pieces and threw it threw it into the black bin the light that would never shine again don't think it ever shone in its life I was bouncing and I kept the receipt and all and thought I'm going to take it back and John who's very patient and he said take it back and say it's not working I said look I busted it I busted it trying to force the things together and it wouldn't go together and I busted it and they're going to just turn around and say to me in the shop you broke it and then it's going to cause another row in Argos now get scooped. I says, I'm not doing it. I just throw it in the bin. So I lost my money. Anyway, keep that in mind as we journey through Mark and what Jesus is saying. We're looking now in Mark chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 21. Keep that in mind. Also, Mark chapter 4, verse 21. Also he, Jesus, also he said to them, is a lamp brought to be put into a bin? It doesn't say that, but also he said to them, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but it should come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Then Jesus said to them, take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And uh, and to you who hear, more will be given. Verse 25. For whoever has to him, more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And he said, the kingdom of God 
is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground and should sleep by night and rise by day and the seed should sprout and grow and he himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, and after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Then he said, To what shall we liken the kingdom of God, or with what parable shall we picture it? It is like a mustard seed, when it is, which when it is sown on the ground is smaller than all the seeds on the earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. And with many such parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. So excuse the pun, but in light of what uh, the passage says and what I'm going to be speaking about tonight, I wonder is the Lord trying to tell me something? I can almost now hear Jesus or imagine Jesus saying, is a lamp bought to be put into a bin? You know, what did you achieve from that? And I know it was stupid. I know it was a complete waste of money. But I was so impatient. And I was so angry with the thing. And, and, and John, you know, trying to say, no, no, we'll take it round. And smashing it and twisting it and throwing it into the bin. A light that would never shine. Well, the next three parables of Jesus, if you notice, they're following on from the parable of the sower. And the question is, Christian, your life is like a lamp. It is a light that needs to shine for all to see. Now, there may be times in life when you feel that people are just trampling you underground. People are, are angry with you and people are coming against you in different ways and they just want to rip you apart and throw you into a bin. You've still got to let your light shine. Remember how Jesus said to his disciples, you, you are the light of the world. And he's saying that today, tonight, to the people in Shiloh Christian Fellowship, to those that are watching in, you are the light of the world. And if we hide our light, and it's a bit like, I don't know if you, you, you can imagine this, but you know when, when parents send their kids to bed, and, and they're saying, like, go to bed. And when they open the door dead quick, the kid's underneath the blanket with a torch or, or whatever else, you know, reading a book or, or, or whatever. And this is what sometimes people's Christian life is like. It's like we've got the light, but we put the blanket over our head because we don't want anybody else to see. We don't want to be caught being the light. If we hide our light, it brings no benefit. It doesn't do what it is supposed to do. And the light of the Christian is supposed to reveal truth and to expose or to dispel darkness. That is why sometimes just you going in to a, a, a place where there's a lot of unbelievers and they know that you're a Christian. That's why sometimes you will face opposition. Because your light is exposing darkness. Your Christian life is exposing their sinful life. And you're not doing that intentionally. Paul says to some you are the fragrance of life. To others you are the fragrance of death. Christian, let me ask you tonight, is your life like a lamp? Is it a light that is shining for all to see? Think about that tonight before you answer it. Remember how Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Well, there are four reasons why a Christian doesn't let their light shine for Jesus. This is a message to Christians. These are following from Jesus' parable of the sower about the heart needing to be ready to receive the word of God. 
And he follows it on with these parables, speaking to his disciples. There are four reasons why a Christian, and we'll put it in inverted commas, doesn't let their light shine for Jesus. The first one is simply, and I've said it in inverted commas, because they're not a born again Christian. Now, let me be very clear about that. There are many, many people right across the United Kingdom. There are many people who attend church. There are many people who will tell you that they are a Christian. There are many people who will call themselves Christians, but they are not Christians. Even Jesus said that on that day of judgment, many will say, did I not do this? Did I not say that? Did I not go here in your name? And Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. They were never Christians. And so this is the first reason why a Christian doesn't let their light shine for Jesus because they're not born again and therefore they haven't got that light in their life to reflect the glory of Jesus. They are either a wayside or a stoner or a prick. They are not prepared. They are not genuinely saved by grace through faith in Jesus. But they think they are. And so tonight I'm saying to people in this place and watching in, if you call yourself a Christian, but you're not born again, you are not a Christian. If you call yourself a Christian and you don't know Jesus personally, you are not a Christian. You are not the light that Jesus is calling you to be because you cannot reflect that light because that light is not in you. Second reason why Christians don't let their light shine for Jesus is because they are ashamed of Jesus. Now you would say, ah, surely not. Christians ashamed of Jesus? Is that you tonight? Are you ashamed of Jesus? Do you see friends or family? Do you have work colleagues? Do you have neighbours when certain conversations come up and you know you should speak about Jesus and tell them about Jesus, but you won't do it because you're afraid of what they might think or what they might say? That means you're ashamed of Jesus. To think that your light won't shine because you're ashamed that people might ridicule you. You're ashamed that people might mock you. You're ashamed that people might laugh at you and think, what an idiot for believing in Jesus in this day and age. And so what you do is you get embarrassed. And so you, you don't allow your light to shine. You cover your light. And these people who are in darkness are not seeing the lights. But listen to what Jesus says to those who are ashamed of him. He says, whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them on that day. Do you hear that? If you're ashamed of Jesus now, you can be sure if you die in that condition that Jesus will be ashamed of you. When you stand before the Lord on the day of judgment. That's his own words. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him the son of man will be ashamed. You've got to let your light shine Christian. The third reason why Christians don't let their light shine for Jesus. Is because they know that they are doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Do you hear that? Now listen tonight, when you are called to be light, when you are called to expose the, the, the lies of the evil one, when you are called to dispel the darkness, when you are called to let your light shine, but you won't do it or you can't do it because you know that you're doing wrong before a holy God. And therefore before God you're scared to bring your light out. In case God turns that light back on you and says to you, look at what you're doing, repent of your sins. You can't let your light shine for Jesus when you know that you're openly disobeying Jesus. There's a big difference here 
in someone who is breaking their heart over their sin in their lives and they want their light to shine, but they're ashamed of the sin in their lives. They're ashamed of how they're living. They're ashamed of things that are happening in their lives. And they're crying out to the Lord, please help me, set me free so that my light can shine. There's a difference between that person and the person who just won't let their light shine because they know that they are sinning before God and they want to keep on sinning before God and they won't let that light shine in case it exposes the sin in their own lives. And the fourth reason why a Christian doesn't let their light shine for Jesus is because they are what's called lukewarm Christians. Revelation says they are neither hot nor cold. And anybody who knows anything about lukewarm water, it's what's called an emetic. It's something that you take to make yourself sick. Is it any wonder that Jesus says about people like this? To the lukewarm believer. He says I will spew you out of my mouth. You make me sick. That is what Jesus is saying. And these lukewarm Christians. They are very often the liberals. The wokes. The snowflake Christians. Who will embrace whatever nonsense is coming into the church. And will seek to propagate that nonsense out into the world. And they are not letting a light shine. They are lukewarm Christians and even the unbeliever knows that they're lukewarm Christians. Continuing in his message to his disciples, Jesus says these words, Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. I believe what Jesus is saying here, I believe he is telling us that we need to not only hear what God is telling us, but we must act on it. We must put it into action in our lives. If you are hearing what God is saying and you're not putting it into action, you can't let your light shine. You are walking in darkness. The more that we let our light shine, the more that we put into action the word of God in our lives, the more it will impact others. But not only that, the more that we do, uh, the more that we put into action and do what God says, the more he will give to us. However, if we don't use it, we'll lose it. Now, I'm not talking about salvation. But if we don't use what God gives us, you can't expect God to give you more. It doesn't work like that. You've got to use. You've got to put into action what God has given you. Tonight when you hear this message, you can hear it. But when you walk out that door, you've got to put it into action. And if you put it into action, God will give you more. And the more that God will give you, you will be able to reach out more and let your light shine more brightly for others to see. In his next parable, still with this whole sowing and growing thing, Jesus basically tells his listeners that the work of God's kingdom is like scattering seeds. It's like sowing seeds. And he says this, the farmer doesn't sow seed and then wait in the field. To watch it grow. Do you remember as kids you might have done that? You might have got a seed in school or, or, or wherever and you were told how to put it into the compost and, and you had to water it and all and, and then an hour later you were over to see was anything starting to grow. <laughs> and the next day you were out looking for it and you give up and then eventually when you went back you saw something started to happen. Well the farmer, the Christian, they don't sow the word of God and then sort of sit in the field waiting. To see if it's going to produce fruit. You get on with what you need to do. Knowing that the seed that you have sown. Will produce fruit. It is going to happen. May not be the fruit that you expect. That's not your problem. Your job is to sow the seed. It's the Holy Spirit. Who waters and gives the increase in that sense. And so too the Christians are to keep on sowing, we're to keep on serving, we're to keep on sharing, letting our light shine before men while trusting that the Lord will give the increase 
in his time. God promises us. Listen Christian. If you are letting your light shine. If you are living your Christian life. If you are unashamed of Jesus. If you are doing the simple things that the Lord asks you to do. He promises you. My word will not return unto me void. But it will accomplish what God pleases. And it shall prosper in the things for which it is sent. God's word will do what God is word, God's word is meant to do. And he is using you to sow that word. He is using you to be the light in the darkness. Even at times when you feel like you're in darkness yourself. He is using your light to make a difference in a dark world. And his word will produce the fruit that God wants it to produce. And so in these last three parables, Jesus declares that the kingdom of God is like sowing the smallest of seeds. He talks about the mustard seed, the smallest of seeds in the Middle East in those days. He talks about sowing the smallest of seeds and he's talking here about faithfully sowing the seeds of God's word. Sometimes it will only be a very small thing that you will do. A small thing that you will say that will make a big difference in someone else's life. But you've got to be faithful. You've got to be faithful and keep on sowing the seeds of God's word. You've got to keep on letting your light shine for all to see. And as we do so, as we faithfully continue to sow, even the seed sown will grow and become great. And many shall benefit from it. Whether we believe it or not. Because God's word does not return to him void Christian Jesus didn't tell these parables these stories for the fun of it he didn't think I'll tell this crowd a nice wee story he is emphasizing our need to have hearts prepared to receive his word that we might produce fruit to the glory of God we need to let our light shine and never be ashamed of who we are as Christians, the Lord promises us not in a false prosperity gospel way, but He promises us that the more we do for Him, the more He will give to us. Not for us to hoard, so that we have so much more to give out. The more that we do for the Lord, the more He will give to us to produce fruit to the glory of God. So let me ask you tonight. Are you a hearer? Are you just a hearer of God's word? Or are you a doer of God's word? Do you hide your light? Or do you let it shine? Are you sowing the word of God by how you live, by how you speak, and by how you act? Getting on with God's word while trusting that he will give the increase in his time Christian be prepared to sow and to reap what you sow this is the other side of it you see you can sow but you will reap what you sow if you sow shame I'm ashamed of Jesus you'll reap it if you sow truth that truth will triumph. Not only will it be continually setting you free, but it will continue to set others free. Are you, are you prepared to sow? And are you prepared to reap what you, you sow? Christian, be prepared to shine. Why? Because here's God's promise. And it is from the word of God in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. God promises you, please listen tonight. Whatever you're going through. Though you struggle as a Christian. Though all hell endeavours to distract you. And to come against you. And deflect you from the ways of God. Listen to the promise of God. To those that let their light shine. He says this. Do not grow weary while doing good. For in due season you shall reap if you do not lose heart. That is the promise of God to you tonight. So when you're leaving this place tonight saying, I'm going to let my light shine. I'm going to sow the word of God by how I live, by how I act, by how I speak. God promises you 
Don't grow weary doing it. Because there, there is a time coming when you will reap what you have sown. Don't lose heart. There's a blessing coming for you. Maybe tonight there's someone here or someone watching in who are not yet a Christian. Well, again, I just want to tell you that as we're journeying through Mark, you will see through all of the passages that we read that Jesus loves you and that he came and he died for you to pay the debt for your sin so that you could become light in the world on his behalf, shining forth light for all to see. Jesus wants to bring you out of the kingdom of darkness, the darkness of sin and of death, and he wants to bring you into his kingdom of glorious light and love and life. Now you can enter into the kingdom of light tonight if you confess your sins. If you agree with God that you are a sinner. If you repent, if you turn around and turn away from your sins. And if you trust in Jesus and in Jesus alone for salvation. Now you have heard the word of God tonight. How's your heart? Is it prepared to receive that word? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you again this evening for your word. We thank you, Jesus, that in the parables that you spoke, you're telling those who trust in you that we are to be light and we're to keep on being light. Even when the darkness seems, Lord God, that it's, it's going to overwhelm us, it won't. Because you, the light of the world, will ensure, Lord God, that our light will not go out. Lord, help us, please, to walk in the light. Help us to be a people who continue by our lives, how we live, how we act, how we speak, to reflect, Lord God, your glory. Help us to bear fruit to the glory of God, to cause your light to shine, to sow seed, Lord God, that will produce fruit in the lives of many other people, please. Help us, Lord, to go forth from this place tonight, purposing in our heart that I'm going to let my light shine. And I'm going to continue sowing the seed that God has given me. That it will produce fruit for his 